parentheses. Medieval Middle Eastern ceramics. And this lecture is about Syria for some time. So Syria is sort of here, um, in the middle of the Middle East, here on the campaign map. Uh, it includes the modern countries of Jordan, Syro-Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, and parts of uh, what is now southern Turkey. Um, so it's quite a large area, what we call Greater Syria rather than just the modern nation-state. This is, this is also the campaign map. All these green sites are sites I've analyzed pottery from. The white ones are just, you know, there. Um, so I've actually done field work in Syria, particularly at Aleppo, where I was working with the team excavating on the um, citadel there for a number of years. Tel Al Sharna and at Deir Marmuza. Uh, the first two will be referred to in this lecture. The other one is, is late and will be in a future lecture. Um, I could mention at the beginning of this um, pottery from Araka um, from the 9th century that uh, is quite interesting, but not especially important, I don't think. Uh, it, uh, they started making pottery there because there was a caliphal palace there for a short time. And there was uh, probably potters brought from Basra and other places, just as recorded, was recorded for Samara. Samara is actually just here. Um, but then, once the caliphs went away, they, the, I think the production center really did not seem to uh, have much presence further along. Although, it's possible that uh, I'm wrong on that. Here is some pottery of a slightly later period. This is actually from a wreck, the, the piece of pottery, called Serce Laman, which is off the west coast of Turkey, just off the map there. Um, but I did petrographic analysis of this and also pottery from Caesarea, um, which is petrographically identical as well as looking like this. Uh, the wreck can be dated by coins to about 1024. I mean, almost precisely 1024, shall we say. Um, so that's about the date of this pottery. So 1024, the 11th century. So this is uh, lead glaze pottery. It's slip in size, so it has a uh, wheel thrown red earthenware body with a white slip and then carving of the slip to show the decoration and then with a lead glaze um, <coughs> with some colouring in. Uh, so this is a, a, becomes a common technology across the Middle East and uh, made in, in numerous smaller centres. And this Caesarea, I think, was one of them making making this pottery. Aleppo, as I said, I have worked there. Um, this is a, a piece of pottery, quite a nice piece, very green uh, lead glaze, um, probably a, a slightly later than that last piece, but still in the 11th century. Um, the petrofabric would actually suggest it's uh, from the Euphrates somewhere. So possibly related to the Raqqa production center from earlier or other sites a bit closer to Aleppo. This one, also about the same period probably. Um, again, slip in size, lead glaze, that sort of thing. Has a petrofabric filled with Fragments of basalt and minerals from basalt, like this plagioclase, which might suggest that it is local, um, because there's lots of basalt outcrops up here, and the the river that goes past it comes from up here and drains this way. So this may in fact be 
Aleppo pottery of the period. So, in about this time, the Middle East was divided amongst all sorts of rulers that ruled their bits. Probably rather more complicated than this map actually would suggest, but uh, gives you a vague idea what's going on. You remember the Boyids from the uh, Basra class. Here's old Basra down here, um, who were sort of running things, although the Khalis were still here. And then there's the Samanids, which were running Khorasan and areas over here. The Fatimids, you might remember. And the Byz Byzantium is still around. And in Syria, there would be a number of uh, people running things. The Ocalids would be one of them. Um, and these borders would, of course, fluctuate a bit as time goes along. But uh, you might notice that this has a title of the Great Seljuk Turks. So this is before they came. So that's what happens next. So the Seljuks uh, are Turkmen, uh, Oguz Turkmen from this part of the world, seems to be uh, their best geographical origin, although originally they probably would have come from the steppes, like all of these horse riding, bow shooting folk do. But uh, this is still within what is now modern Turkmenistan, so this is the homeland, shall we say, of, of the Seljuks. In 985, the original Seljuk himself, the leader of this group, um, and the ancestor of, of, of their um, sultans, eventually, um, had everybody adopt Islam at Jand in 985. So after that, they are uh, Sunni Muslims, and it is such that they start making greater impact on the locals. They take Merv and Nishapur in 1038, and then at the Battle of Dan Danakan in 1040, they defeat other people who were trying to take over after the Samanids and um, basically start r ruling all of this territory as the beginnings of, of their empire. Uh, but they get around a bit. Then there's a battle, a Capetron, um, where they inflict a rather heavy defeat on the Byzantines. And in 1055, they're invited by the Abbasid Khalif to come to Baghdad and, and run things for them. And uh, that will be it for the Buyids. Um, because, of course, the uh, Abbasid Sultan would like the fact that they are the same Sunni Islamic faith as, as him. So this would continue. In 1071 was the Battle of Manzikert. Very important battle. It was basically the end of the Byzantines in this part of the world. Uh, there was very little left in Asia of Byzantium. I haven't like coloured in the other bit. For one thing it's annoying and fiddly and the other thing is not particularly relevant. But it's basically they lose the, this red bit. And uh, in 1077, the Seljuk army, as I told you previously, um, actually besieges Fustat. It doesn't actually overthrow the, the, the Fatimids, um, but they lose all of their land in Asia. And so the map goes from something like this to something like this. This is uh, under Malik Shah, the, the, uh, the high point of the Seljuk domain. Um, not all of this is directly ruled. Uh, the entire empire was, was somewhat uh, a matter of there would be local Seljuk leaders under Malik Shah who were really running things for themselves. But, um, but this is the Seljuk realm, more or less. Um, this is... Uh, Seljuks are what we often call pottery, particularly in Iran, when we get to Iran in the next lecture, it's often called Seljuk pottery, even years after the last Seljuk 
Um, and th this is somewhat fair, as the Seljuks brought in a period of uh, uniformity and patronage of the arts and patronage of, of ordinary things like road building that uh, basically created a period of prosperity that did continue for some time up until, in fact, the Mongol conquest when they killed everybody. Uh, Isfahan was the capital for Malik Shah, and this is very important when we get to Iran, and we'll probably see this slide again. So remember the Fatimids. Remember we had a whole like lecture about the Fatimids. And so you remember that this is like the lustreware sequence, and of course, as it turns out, when when I first did this, it was thought all this pottery, mostly studied from Fustat, this stuff at the top was actually made in uh, Beirut. Uh, there was made pottery made in in Fustat, and it might be useful to have that instead. But it uh, it is interesting that it is a, a a continuation of tradition. Basically, the only thing they changed was the um, the pottery, the clay they made the pottery with. <clears throat> so at about this time, you remember my hypothesis that these potters were trying to get away from Fustat being a very place to, bad place to live at this time, with like a famine going from 1065 to 1072. That's seven years of, of, of people starving to death and, and clearly not wanting to buy lustreware pottery. And so this would be a good time to move on. And I think, judging by the fact that this is the springboard, this, this style of ceramics made in the phase two here, this is a springboard for this Beiruti stuff, for Spanish luster wares, and also for another group of Syrian uh, luster wares, which we call Telmanese wares. Uh, all of these seem to, to spring off at the same time, and possibly also Iranian uh, luster wares, which we should get to next week. So, um, so that's what's going on here. So 1065, 1066, 1067, people are thinking, let's go somewhere else. So, previously I have suggested that the luster potters may in fact be Shia. So I thought it was interesting to see where were the Shia in Syria. And of course that's actually very difficult. Um, what you can do is see where the Shia are now. Um, and also this is a common problem with looking at religions or ethnicities or anything like that and relating them to a map. Uh, sometimes a city will have far more people in it than the surrounding countryside. Uh, this in particular, you see. And so it's possible for large areas of land to be one group of people. Um, but the city is a completely different group of people who are not related and um, far more numerous. So it might look like a large area of land, but in fact the large number of people are the people in the city. So the data on the cities will be complicated. But that said, I'm going the wrong way. That said, we have a number of um, relevant things here. The Hamdanids and the Ukhalids who were running this part of the world were both mainstream Shia uh, believers. <clears throat> and we have the Nizari Ismailis. This, the little yellow bits are where they live now. These are Nizari castles. Um, you often find them referred to in the literature as the assassins, which is a bit of a pejorative nowadays, so I probably won't call it. So the Nizaris all lived around here founded by uh, Al-Nazar in 1095. And there's the Alawites all up here. You might or may not know of the Alawites as being what the ruling dynasty in Syria presently are Alawites. And uh, they were created by Ibn Nasser in the late 9th century. And we have the Druze. Here are the Druze down here. These are closely related to the Fatimids and were founded in 1014. And it's interesting to note 
that in fact, and these, these are the, where the mainstream Shia, 12 or Shia are, and these are the green bits. So the green bits here are archaeological sites, not Shia cities. Um, the um, interesting thing, so Tripoli is about the border between what was previously Byzantine ruled Western Syria and Fatimid ruled Western Syria. And so it's interesting to see that these are all within the Fatimid realms and these are all within the Byzantine realms. So it's interesting when you go to Alawite territory that you don't see a lot of mosques um, and uh, they, it's quite easy for uh, Alawites to get into secular uh, administration as the current administration of Syria. And it's, it's possible this is related to the fact that during most of the development of the, their um, people, um, this was actually ruled by the Byzantines. So how or whether this is relevant or not, I have no idea. But um, here is Beirut, which we've already referred to. Um, now the capital of Lebanon, so it's probably com complicated. So Beirut. So as we know, this is pottery from Beirut. Um, the luster wares, which were abundant in Fustat, apparently came from Beirut, which is reasonable. There's a lot of Syrian pottery in Beirut, in Fustat actually. This one's actually from um, Tel Al Asharna, one of the sites I worked on. It's a actually restorable vessel, although the glaze is worn off. And it's quite nice. This is an underglaze painted ware, of which more later. <clears throat> And this, this is what the petrofabric looks like, and it has uh, a lot of carbonate in it, and quartz, and that's about it. And we have the Telmanese wares. This is named after the site of Telmanese, which is the site where it was found. This is one in the Rome, it's my favorite piece, actually. So Telmanese ware is all consistently of the same fabric that I've analyzed. And it's a very fine quartz um, with occasional chert inclusions in it. Uh, quite distinctive. Um, and we find it in all of these. So here is Telmanis. This is the nearby city of Maratha Numan, uh, Roman origins. It got quite a nice little castle, which is built in the Roman theater. But it's a, a good sized city. But it's at Telmanis that this this pottery is associated with um, because the, it was found in caves. Oh, so this is like a windrose and so it wouldn't be completely irrational for them to be making tel pottery at Telmanis even though the big city here is Marat Numan. The problem with it is this is a limestone territory and there's not a lot of chert in here to be and I, I would not expect to find such an abundance of quartz and so little chert in an area dominated by limestone. This is the, the sort of terrain around there. But one thing you do find in all this limestone is caves. There's a lot of caves around here, and that is, in fact, where Telmanese wares were found. So they were stashed in here. Either they were the people putting them in these caves were on the run, or it was just normal storage location, which they never got a chance to come back to. But basically, there were just a lot of very nice whole vessels stored in here and then discovered hundreds of years later. So that's that's why it's known as Telmanese ware. And these are some examples of ones actually recorded as being found at Telmanese. Um, things you will notice in here is, is this rim, which is obviously related to the Fatimids, the incision through the uh, luster paint related to phase two at uh, Fustat, and also the, uh, the imagery is related to some of the things we saw in Fatimid Egypt. So it's, um, it's clearly a next phase sort of thing. Another thing that is found um, of 
probably the same period, certainly the same period, um, is known as Lacabi ware. This is, more importantly probably, I should have said, is of the same petrographic fabric, the petrofabric, as the Taiwanese wares. Uh, but it's typically in broad dishes like this because they create a design inside. Um, what they do, so this is a stone paste body, all of Telmanese is stone paste, um, and they've carved the uh, design of this creature on it. It's some sort of sphinx thing. Um, it's got a human head and a, and a wing. And then put paint on it and then glazed it. Now this is a, a lead alkali glaze, uh, um, a hybrid glaze. And so since there's lead in it, it's quite runny. And so the, um, during the firing, and so that the paint has run and you wouldn't be able to recognize this anything, as anything other than a blob if it wasn't for the carving. So this is not a common type, but it's, uh, it's quite interesting. Another type of uh, the Telmanese pottery of the same fabric are monochrome and sized wares. And there's turquoise, cobalt blue and white with blue splashes, rather like we saw at Fustat, except you never get green. So, <clears throat> I'll get back to Telesharna. Uh, that was from Telesharna, if I didn't mention that before. Um, but since it's related to the Crusades, we should probably mention the Crusades. Um, because Crusades came in 1098. Um, they sort of divided at first. And you, if you know anything about the Crusades, you know that some of them were actually just after land and weren't like zealously after the holy places and so some of them spooled off and went to Edessa and took that over. Others of them went to Antakya and uh, besieged it and while they were there they spread around trying to take other places. They tried to take Aleppo but got stopped and here's in fact Maratu Numan and Telmanese down here. Um, this was a very unpleasant time um, this was had a lot of Christians in it, in Antakya, but they were Eastern Christians, so not particularly liked by the invading Europeans. And what the Seljuk governor of Antakya did was he, he sent out the, uh, the Muslim men one day to dig the city ditch deeper to defend the city before the Crusaders arrived. And the next day he sent the Christians out to make the ditch deeper and lock the gates and wouldn't let them back in again because he didn't want all those Christians in when the Crusaders were coming along. And so then when the Crusaders came, there were already a whole bunch of, of men standing around outside who would much rather go home. Um, and this created a lot of contention between the two because the, as I said, the Europeans didn't particularly like the Eastern Christians and the Eastern Christians would much, much rather go home. Um, and so there was a lot of discord between them and the Crusaders would often accuse the local Christians of, of betraying them to the, to the, uh, the Muslims in, in Antakya. And one, one time they said they had caught a spy amongst the Christians and actually roasted him and ate him. Um, they were all very hungry at the time as well, but basically it was to intimidate all of those Christians. Um, so it was not very nice. Um, Marat al Numan, which is recorded as being the site of a major massacre of the local people um, by the Crusaders, it was again, they were so hungry, uh, it's recorded that they ate the babies of the citizens of Marat. Um, and this is from their own records. This isn't like some Muslim propaganda saying, yes, these crazy Christians come and ate the babies. Uh, this is from the, the, the Christian records saying that they were such good Christians um, and the locals were no better than animals and so they ate their babies. 
not at all nice. Not a place you want to hang around, really, is it? So then uh, the Crusaders took Antioch, Antakya, and you know basically killed a lot of people and were very unpleasant. But then a, a bunch of them went straight down to Jerusalem. Uh, so in 1099 they took Jerusalem and killed a lot of people in there too, massacred all the Jews and a lot of the local Christians, although they, they don't like them, and, and like that. So not very nice. But... Uh, they seem to be in a hurry going down here. And this is the result. So here's the county of Edessa, the principality of Antioch, uh, the county of Tripoli, and the kingdom of Jerusalem. And so Beirut here um, might have survived. So 1099, if we thought they would have come in 1060, 1070, and set up making pottery there um, would have been fine. The Crusaders would come along. It would seem that they were in a bit of a hurry and weren't interested in obliterating everybody on the way to get to Jerusalem um, and kill everybody there instead. So it's uh, it's possible that they, they got away without being too badly dealt with and managed to continue making pottery in the Crusader period. Of course, if they were making pottery here, it is probably not so nice. Um, and that would be a reason for them to leave. Uh, but as I say, I don't actually necessarily think that they would have made it at Telmanis or Marat or Numan. Um, I think they might have made it at Antioch, Antakya. Now, the reason for this is that it's um, the biggest city around. It was, it was a huge city. So this, this is the extent of Antioch. Uh, here's the Orontes going by it. And it was, it was a huge city in its day. Um, we know it was this big, and the, this is... This would have, would have been unoccupied on this hillside going up to a ridge along here. But um, the later city was just around here. You can see this where the little streets show you the traditional street pattern. But we do know that the walls were this big and that they made sure they were defending all of this. There's the detailed account of the Crusaders trying to get into the city uh, really show that this is the size of the city. So. If those uh, potters coming from Fustat were looking for somewhere for, where there was a market, Antioch would have been a good place to go. Although Beirut actually was a, quite a small city, so that argument might not be so useful. If they were making pottery in Antioch, they were probably making it over here somewhere and could actually go there and have a look. Only my wife won't let me. Or could be up here somewhere. So if that is what happened when the Crusaders came and went to Edessa and came down to Antioch and there were battles on the way to Aleppo so they couldn't escape to Aleppo, the potters, if they were leaving Antioch, probably would have gone this way. They're not going to go to Jerusalem direction because they know the Crusaders are going that way. They're not going to go in the Aleppo direction because there are battles on the way and Aleppo is an important prize to take. So they might have tried to escape through Maratu Numan and Telmanis and hidden their pottery there. But they were followed by the Crusaders and had to move on to places like Raqqa here and south to Damascus and never got to go back to get their pottery again. Just an idea. So this is Tel al Sharna again. And this is the, the Beiruti ware, underglazed painted ware. And this is Tel al Sharna. This whole thing here is the tell. And here there's like a low tell and a high tell up here, for which this is the, the biggest and the tallest. And, oh, there you go. And at this, this is the tallest bit. At the site in 2001, 2000 or so, um, there were some archaeologists from uh, Laval University in Quebec 
who came here looking to dig the place up, basically, surveying it. Um, but they were interested in the Iron Age because they thought it was an important Iron Age site. Um, well, it is an important Iron Age site. But what really gave them the willies is they found the top of it was covered with glazed pottery, as in medieval Islamic glazed pottery. And so they came to me. And it was all of this Telmanis and Beirut, Beiruti ware of the early 11th century or late, yes, late 11th century, of about 1075 to 1100, let me put it that way. And, um, and so I looked at it and I said, you know, this is very odd because the location of Tal al-Asharna is right between a major crusader castle, nowadays we call it Kalat Mudik, in those days they called it Afamia, and the Ismaili castle of Abu Qubais, and the Runkidite um, fortress of Shazar, so mainstream uh, Sunni Muslims over here. So with like one group of Muslims over here, and the Ismailis up here, and the Crusaders over here, down here in this valley, there's all a big valley here, you see, um, is this hill covered with really nice pottery. And I said, either someone was having a picnic there and it went very badly, or there's a castle underneath it. Um, as it turned out, there was a castle underneath it. And so I, I looked into the history of it. Oh, too fast. And so I found that there was this occasion in 1109, 1110, Tancred of Antioch, <clears throat> the Prince of Antioch, came down this way in his annual campaign to try to take Shazar. <clears throat> Shazar was difficult to take, so he built a castle in a location which was close enough to Shazar to, to keep an eye on it. He comes back in 1111. In the next year, there's a massive battle. Basically, everyone was ready. Um, the king of Jerusalem came. Um, this was one of the first major battles which involved uh, a, a Turkish army, a Turkic army. And it's recorded how um, the horse archers managed to keep the crusaders away from water just just running around them shooting at them and and so it was ended up as uh non-decisive um but basically a defeat for the crusaders who went home and never bothered shazar again or well, that might have been because the next year tancred dies so interestingly shazar is where osama ibn munkid comes from who you may not have heard of but you should because he wrote this very interesting um, life of princes, shall we say? It's like this. This is this is uh, my life at this time, and it, it's very interesting. He talks about living at Shazar. He was part of the the family that owned it, and his relationships with the uh, the Ismailis at Abu Qubais and the Crusaders at Kalat Mudik. Or Afamia, but never mentions this because by then it would have been completely destroyed. Um, and he left Shazar in about 1130. So in between Tancred dying or this massive battle and the youth and maturity, early maturity, shall we say, of Osama, um, that disappeared and was never referred to again until we found it. And this is me digging part of that. Actually, I think this is an Iron Age bit, but uh, that's me digging up here, digging up. This is me on the right, although I'm gray like this guy now, of course. So, here you go. 
tell many swears. Um, tell many swears um, also come with blue glazes like this one, or like this one, clearly cobalt in this case. And of course, there's quite a few of these Lakabi wares, including this. This seems to be the same technology um, with this runny glaze on top of the stone paste. This one also, or there's more paint on this one. It's found in Rafika, which is near Raqqa. And this one found uh, the same place, although it's harder to date because of the technology. So, after that, so after about 1100 possibly, and I, um, <clears throat> my thoughts on the dating of the Telmanese wares ha has changed over the years and this wobbliness will be evident. Um, but originally I was thinking like 1075 based on the Fustat evidence to maybe, you know, 1125 or so. But the more I became convinced that it was the Crusaders that nobbled that production center because it never made pottery ever again. Now, we know Beirut continued making pottery, but wherever they were making the, the lusterwares in, in northwestern Syria, um, they stopped making them. And so um, there's some reason why they had to stop making them. And, and having an unpleasant experience with the Crusaders would be a, a good explanation. After that, there's certainly pottery made at Damascus, at Araka, um, Maskina. I haven't actually analyzed pottery from it, but there is evidence of it. And I've found a number of fabrics in what is evidently Syrian pottery, and also Aleppo, <coughs> which I'll get to. So, <clears throat> As you can see, these later looking at the, the sequence from Fustat again, there's a lot of these dishes with broad rims, and we see exactly that in the, the, the next phase of, of stone paste ceramics made in Syria, which are all made at Raqqa, it seems. Um, <clears throat> you might notice that the phases are less sequential in Syria because we have a number of production centers going on at the same time, which is awkward. Um, but at Raqqa, from somewhere between 11 and 1125 or so, and, and for a bit after that, they're making a lot of these small bowls and these broad dishes with flat rims and luster painting them like this. And you see a lot of this, this rim, for instance. And there's an example of, of one of the bowls, I think. Um, you can see there's some sort of attempt at calligraphy on the back. So this is the Raqqa fabric filled with a lot of very cloudy quartz. Um, it's called Raqqa 2 for complicated reasons I can't go into now, but uh, Raqqa 1 um, probably isn't from Raqqa, effectively. This is based on analysis of wasters actually from Raqqa. Here is Raqqa, and we do have uh, kiln sites here, but they're from the 9th, um, 10th century period. Um, the location of the later potteries are probably somewhere else. Well, I don't know where. There's also this other fabric, which I call the Marat fabric, in quotation marks. It might be better to call it the Bartles fabric because it's part of a gift by a chap called Bartles to the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. And the dealer said, this is from Telmanese, that is near Marat. And if you looked at the pottery, you could see that it does look a bit like Telmanese pottery, um, possibly a little later. Um, but... Um, the petrology is completely wrong. This has a lot of coarse quartz with felsbars in it. And so this is made somewhere else. 
I don't actually know where. Um, maybe it's actually made at Maratu Daman and the Talmanese wares are not made there. That would actually work for me quite well. But um, it would be an example, possibly, of a, of a production center that started very soon after um, the end of the Talmanese production center and did actually continue for some time. So this is uh, one of the Raka Luster wares, one of the earlier ones. Um, and you see that same rim. And then we get to group three, which as you can see, is contemporary with group two. So again, this will be continuing after the end of the Telmanese production center. And this one is entirely Damascus. Another thing this is, is entirely underglazed painted wares. Um, I call this the S-back group because they all have these little S-shaped motifs on the back, which I think is also related to calligraphy, like we saw on that other piece from Raqqa. The Damascus petrofibre is very distinctive. It's very clear quartz, which is made from sand. There's a, some source of very well-rounded sand, very clear, um, and they're grinding this down to, to make pottery out of. So the evidence for production of Damascus is actually much later. It's from, from the uh, late 14th, 15th century, and um, this is all over this sort of area. The, um, the evidence for production of Syrian pottery in that period, often called Mamluk after the ruling dynasty, is entirely Damascus. There's, there's no evidence for production centers anywhere else in, in the literature or in historical accounts or anything like that. And there's only one fabric in this pottery. And so putting two and two together would suggest that that is what Damascus looks like. Um, and so that's, that's that. So this probably brings up the whole issue of what is underglazed painted ware. This is underglazed painted ware. As you can see, it's very attractive. This is quite an early piece. So you can see once they got into it, they got into it quite well. So in this case, this is a stone paste uh, pottery. Um, so the white here you see is the white body. And it's painted with oxide pigments. So there's cobalt and chromium for the black, cobalt blue, chromium black, and iron for the yellow. And then it has an overall alkali glaze. So if, if this was a lead glaze or a hybrid lead alkali glaze, these pigments, being just pigments with no slip medium, would run and there'd just be blotches of different colors here. It would not have this precise look to it as under glaze painted wear. So you can see <clears throat> once they worked out how to make this, it was very nice. They'd never been able to make anything like this before. Very detailed. And um, a good thing about it is unlike luster wares, which you have to fire again, you just fire this once. And so it would be much cheaper and with much cheaper materials. So if you do this, it works out very well. It's cheap to produce. It's very beautiful and colorful. And you can see there's actually a lot more attention to detail in this than there is in the contemporary luster wares, which actually look quite rough, like this. And so <clears throat> that's very nice, but you know, not quite as detailed as said the glazed painted ware. So my theory of why they did underglazed painted wear is based on the fact that this looks very different from this with regards to the color of its paint. See, they're both luster wares, but this is a copper rich luster wear. It's entirely copper. There's hardly any silver in it here at all. Whereas this has a lot of silver in it. It's a silver rich luster paint. The glaze is an alkali glaze. This is a lead alkali glaze. So if we look at it like this, also Lakabi where you see, these are the Telmanese wares. You have the luster wares, the underglaze, and the, uh, the Lakabi wares, which are in fact underglaze painted, although they're very, very blobby. And so they will have lead and alkalis. Typically, no tin. So then 
they make alkali glaze luster wares with a um, copper rich luster paint. Now why they would do that, so this is before 1100, this is after 1100. You know, don't know how much before and after, but let's just say before and after 1100. Or possibly even 1099, before the Crusades, after the Crusades. And there has been this theory of a silver shortage in about 1100 for many years now, based on coinage. Um, there, for some, for some reason, well, not some reason, because of the Crusades, let's just, just say it, because of the Crusades, there was a shortage in silver in the Middle East. And so there was hardly any silver making coins with. And so it occurred to me, well, that's why they stopped making silver rich luster paint, because of the silver shortage. So they switched from a silver um, luster paint to a copper luster paint. And the problem with that is that copper, oh look, it's in lead. Um, so I have lead. No lead. Okay. So the problem with that is that when you, if you just tried to have a copper rich luster paint on a lead glaze, it's likely to just turn black because they both reduce in unsimilar conditions. And that will turn the lead black. And so you want to have an alkali glaze. So that's why they switched to an alkali glaze. Now, the interesting thing about Lacabi ware is it's basically you have a white pottery that you then paint and then you then glaze. And so you can see the design because of the carving. But if you put this under an alkali glaze, you quickly find out that what you paint is what you get. You don't, so you don't end up, you end up not needing to do all this carving to create the design. So my hypothesis is that because they had to switch from a silver rich luster ware to a copper rich luster ware, they then switched from a lead rich glaze or a glaze with some lead in it to an alkali glaze. And when they did that with Lacabi ware, they invented underglaze painted ware. This would be quite an important thing to do because underglaze painted ware subsequently, although luster wares, luster wares did have their comebacks at time, in the long run, it was the underglaze painted wares that became the most important pottery types, as you will be finding out later on. Here is an SEM image through underglaze painted ware. And as you can see, this is chromium. Um, and so this is just chromium oxide particles on the surface of the ceramic, this is all stone paste, with an alkali glaze over it. So these were produced in very large numbers in Damascus. Um, they're found all over the Middle East and found in Europe. Um, they were traded across the Mediterranean to Europe. Um, these are actually all from Fustat, where other uh, people have suggested they may be made locally, but lots of things are thought to be made locally in Fustat. I have thought things were made be, be made locally in Fustat, and it turns they were made somewhere else because they have a lot of money and they can buy pottery from anywhere. Here's quite a nice one with another one of these strange sphinxy things on. This one has like a large part of a body and wings and a head on its tail. And this has birds, quite nice. So this brings up the issue of Ayyubid pottery. So traditionally, all of these ceramics are often called Raka wares because I'll tell you now, in fact, Raqqa was destroyed by the Mongols. And so it became basically a big ruin field. And so it was a good place for people to find pottery. Um, Raqqa only started being rebuilt in the late 1930s, 20th century. So until then, it was just a ruin field covered with pottery. And a lot of that pottery got dug up and went to the market, the art market. And so Raqqa pottery 
became a big thing. And so a lot of this, um, these glaze wares, these luster wares and underglaze painted wares were called raka wares, even though they might be made somewhere else in the long run. Another thing they recorded is Ayyubid pottery because of the dynasty that later on ran this part of the world. But in fact, we're starting off with a man called Zengi. Um, Zengi was running things around here until 1146. He was the Atabeg of Mosul. Hang on, if I go back. Okay, Mosul is also an important player in this, along with Aleppo and Damascus. So he was the Atabeg of Mosul and then Aleppo. Um, and Atabeg is a Seljuk ruler. Um, it, it's, I think it's supposed to mean like father commander in, uh, in Turkish. And um, it's the commander of an army for a member of the royal family. Um, but it's basically the ruler. And he was a, a Seljuk. Uh, he was a, a Nogos Turk, Turkman. And um, so he was of that group. He conquers Edessa in 1144. Makes him very popular. Um, but soon after that he dies, he's succeeded by his son, Nuruddin. And Nuruddin also gets into it. A um, couple of battles. Um, there's the Battle of Ina, where he defeats uh, the Antiochi people. Um, then he acts as Damascus, which of course then means all of this territory is uh, all on the same side, shall we say, because it wouldn't stop the, the ruler of Damascus, the governor of Damascus, siding with the Crusaders for their own benefit. So it's good to have all your eggs in one basket. Then there's the Battle of Harim. You can see it's really getting into Crusader territory now. Banias, take this castle away. So he's all over the shop. And in 1164 to about 1169, he sends off two of his guys to Egypt. Um, and these guys are Kurds, but they uh, work for the Seljuks. Um, and so they're part of the Seljuk-like army, but ethnically they're Kurdish. And there were two brothers, um, Ayub and Shirka. Uh, Shirka had one eye and is one of the most interesting characters of all time. The son of Ayub was named Yusuf. Uh, you probably know him better as Saladin. So Yusuf ibn Ayub went to Egypt and they basically took over Egypt from the Fatimids. Shortly after that, because in 1174 uh, Nuruddin dies, um, Saladin takes over. In 1175 he takes Damascus and becomes the Sultan, the king of Egypt and Syria. In 1182 he takes Aleppo as well. So Saladin is basically the guy. He is the founder of what becomes known as the Ayyubid dynasty. And so a lot of this pottery is in fact not from his reign after 1175, but is Zengid. So the things they're telling you so far are actually Zengid, not Ayyubid, um, which uh, is only fair, but uh, that's just life. So Saladin goes on to the Battle of Hattin, uh, 1187, where he defeats the Crusaders and takes Jerusalem. Then he dies. So after he dies, uh, he's succeeded by um, various sons and relatives that rule as part of the world, um, the Ayyubid dynasty. Uh, and they're replaced in about 1250 by the Mamluks. And um, one of the reasons they're replaced is the Mongols come and take over large areas over here. Destroy Raqqa, um, try to destroy Aleppo and also Damascus. So back to the pottery. So this is group four. Now, unfortunately, this is made in a number of places. 
and so it's difficult to actually look and say oh here's a here's a Raqqa one here's a Damascus one I don't know if this is the people move, moving about um, or they were just like oh so that's, a, that's what they're doing in town or 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 maybe a bit of both um, I often call this the arc back group and a distinctive form is what I call a proto biconical bowl and it looks like this so here we go this is a conical bowl okay so geometrically this is dictated by a cone it's a conical bowl this is a biconical bowl it's dictated by two cones this is halfway in between you see the base is actually wide you know the base of the bowl the interior of the bowl wider than the rim so it's not a simple conical bowl but it's not really a cone underneath but it's getting that way so this form you find in Egypt and you find it in Syria and you find it in Iran where they're all making exactly the same form but this is all before 1200 after about 1200 they seem to be making the biconical bowl so it's quite a, a useful chronological distinction about 1200 I don't know exactly but you know about 1200 oh and they've got boxes around them that's fun so group five I'll, I'll show you an art pack in a minute um, group five the dash back uh, derived from the S back so this is going up until 1200 and these are made in Damascus and Raqqa again and the uh, the line back group group six contemporary or possibly later as well um, this is actually from the Smarat petrofabric so we know this continued soon after um, Telmanis and was probably made into um, up to 1250 here is a line back one you see it's got a line on its back and here's a dash back one so it's like you can see it's derived from the S backs but it's just a dash and here's actually an arc back one so a number of styles but all made in the same place and in some degrees not all at the same time and this is probably also a line back one very similar designs so that brings us to Aleppo I'll mention Aleppo because I like it I've never found a waster at Aleppo even though I worked there for a number of years probably because I was mostly working in the Citadel no I was entirely working in the Citadel actually this is where we were excavating deep into this very large lump of dirt um, <clears throat> and this is on the edge of the early medieval city in the middle of the later medieval city a bit later than the period we're looking at right now um, and it's in the middle of the biggest city in Syria or one of the biggest cities it's either Damascus or Aleppo is and Aleppo thinks they they the government in, in Damascus rigs the census so that Damascus is always bigger but if there was a search for it it would probably be under where all these people are living or something or it might have been within the city or something because we oh this is, yeah this is a I thought you'd like to see a nice picture here is the Citadel of Aleppo worked here for a number of, of seasons this is before the war when they blew all this lot up unfortunately so the uh, excavators there before I arrived hypothesized that pottery that looked like this and they, they found quite a lot of them there were locally made and the style of it is clearly related to contemporary uh, pottery so this is probably from the late 12th century early 13th century um, but there there isn't anything else quite like it so they thought this must be made locally you can see it's related to these so-called rocker wares or things by then I was saying while well, they're making this in Damascus and other places as well so they were saying we think this is made here and so I thin sectioned it and went back and told them I think it's made here too because it has what looks like agate in it and agate is a type of quartz you would get from basalt which as I've already told you is upstream 
from Aleppo. So there's not going to be a lot of quartz, you see, that's not from an agate source if you're downstream from very large basalt flows. So that works quite well. Um, then there's group seven. Group seven is your actual Raqqa ware, which is actually made in Raqqa. And this is made from about 1200, 1250. And I call it often the scroll back group. Here is a full biconical bowl, two, two, two cones together, you see. They're all conical, biconical bowls. And here's the scrolling back, very typical of the luster ware. And uh, here's another one, different form. <clears throat> and another thing you'll find is in this infill is often lines, uh, scrolls of lines, which is interesting because if you compare that con to contemporary Iran, um, the luster potters there, what they would do, would, they would paint all of this and then inscribe scrolls through it. So we're making something very similar, but in a very different way. So if you ever see the little scrolls being painted, it's probably from Raqqa. And if you see them being incised, it's probably from Kashan. Here's another one, see, painted. Nice one. They often have blue bits. So this would be an inglaze paint. Um, so because it's it's not an underglaze paint, it's it's right in the glaze. Um, and so that would explain why it actually runs a bit, because they have a glaze and then they put the paint on and then they fire it and then they put the luster paint on. And here's another one. This is an alborello though. And a jar. So I'd show you a few different forms, again with the, the lines. And they also made things like this. This is a nice little table. And you can see slab construction, added corners here and that sort of thing. <coughs> and this nice box with interesting griffin-like creatures on. So that brings me to this site, which is in Italy, San Giovanni in Ravello. Remember me telling you about Ravello before and the, and the, and the uh, Duomo, the uh, cathedral. Well, this is a, a smaller church. Um, just up the road in Ravello, um, where they have this, very nice. You go up there and tell people all about what you think. Um, and here is uh, Mary Magdalene and Jesus, and then don't, don't touch me. And up here there is Islamic pottery. Look at that, it's all this Islamic pottery up here. So they've got nice round bits of Islamic pottery and set it right in there. Isn't that nice? So this is all, um, this is underglaze painted ware. This is a very typical alternative to that polychrome underglaze painted ware. So it's chromium black and a copper colored alkali glaze. The turquoise and black becomes a very big thing. Um, and this is black and blue. And here is some more. This is more polychrome. So these would all be from the late 1100s, early 1200s, all of these. This, however, is Telman Eastware. Uh, you can tell because it's, it's blue with luster paint on. And the luster paint's been incised through it in the Telman East technique. Oh, I'll put a circle so I didn't forget it. And here's another one. You can see a bit more clearly. See blue, cobalt blue and incised lines to uh, to define the design. So um, here, quite nice. So we have all sorts of beautiful bits of glass and things like that. But the turquoise bits are actually pottery. See? And uh, if you look carefully, it has black lines on it. So that means it's from an arc back group. So that's quite interesting. So from these two places in Ravella, we have one which has all this Fatimid pottery and it's all from one phase. It's all made at the same time. And someone actually asked me a question. Did I think they imported it and then broke it? 
I think they did um, in that case. In this case, we have pottery from a number of periods all being used at the same time. And this seems to me more like loot from the Crusades, which came over in different times and then was broken. Possibly it was already broken and then used in the vessels. And the, the vessel sides will be used as turquoise tiles, uh, tesserae, and the bases, the round bases, uh, would go into the sides of the structure. So, in 1250, everything changes. Um, the Mamluks take over from the west, the Mongols destroy much of eastern Syria. Raqqa itself is destroyed and never makes pottery again. Um, I don't know where that Marat, so-called Marat in quote, I'm wiggling my fingers at you now, quotation marks, the Bartles Gift Group, but if that was on the, um, <coughs> actually a site on the Euphrates, it would also have been destroyed by the Mongols. Um, so wherever these are made, all of these sites are now destroyed by the Mongols, apart from Damascus, which continues on into the Mamluk period. And we will be looking at the period after 1250 in a future lecture next year. Thank you.